Welcome to Out Motorsports, the channel for cars as you are. My name is Jake, and this is the 2022 Mini Cooper S. I was at a friend's place for a get-together over the weekend while I've been driving this car, and two of my friends showed up and said, we have a question for you. What is the campiest automaker that currently sells new cars in the United States? And for those who haven't really thought about the term camp in a while, if ever, campiness is kind of this interesting thing. It's kind of this tongue-in-cheek, don't take yourself so seriously, but take yourself seriously kind of vibe. The immediate answer that came to my mind was, of course, Mini. And that brings us to this one today. This is the third generation of two-door Mini Cooper. This is called the F56 generation, and it came out for the 2014 model year. This is in its second iteration of LCI in BMW Mini speak. These are life cycle impulse updates. This means it's basically had two facelifts. So Mini is readying another generation of Mini Cooper in the next few years, but this one is going to be your Mini Cooper for another few years until then. Let's talk about what this 2022 Mini Cooper S is, talk about where it fits in the Mini Cooper lineup, and then we'll get it out on the road and see how it actually is to drive. And before we get too far into this, if you're watching this video and you happen to like it or at least don't hate it, please take a second and hit that like button. It really helps just generate some support for us among the YouTube community. And if you happen to like this whole channel, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss anything that's coming up next. So thank you for all that support. And now on to the Mini Cooper. This is as iconic old school Mini as you're going to get with a modern car. This is what they call the two-door hardtop. And this one is the middle range of the two-door hardtop models. So you've got three different gas-powered models of two-door Mini Cooper. You've got the base Mini Cooper, you've got this one, which is the Mini Cooper S, and then you've got the Mini Cooper John Cooper Works, which is their hottest of hot hatches. They do also sell this two-door model as a two-door fully electric Mini Cooper. It's called the Cooper SE. I have not driven one of those yet, but I do have a friend in Ohio who owns one in this same green, and adores it. The range is not the highest thing, but he says it is super duper fun to drive. Hopefully we can get one of our own to get a little spin in, but we're talking about the Mini Cooper S today and it's gasoline powered drivetrain. So drivetrain wise, what is under the hood of this Mini Cooper S? How does it compare with the base and the John Cooper works? Well, the base car gets a three cylinder, 1.5 liter turbocharged engine. The John Cooper Works gets a turbocharged four cylinder that makes about 228 horsepower. This one is gonna split the difference between the base and the John Cooper Works. It's 55 horsepower more than the base Mini Cooper for a total of 189. You get 207 pound feet of torque, and that is all from a BMW B48 engine under the hood, which is a two liter turbocharged four cylinder. Horsepower and torque are all wonderful, but they're honestly kind of meaningless unless you know how much the car weighs and put it all into some context. So the power to weight ratio is something that we talk about a lot on this channel because it matters and not a lot of people out otherwise talk about it. The Mini Cooper S that is sitting here right now weighs 2,813 pounds. It is, first of all, phenomenal to see a brand new car that weighs under 3,000 pounds. Weight is kind of the enemy of good handling and of longevity and of wear items. The lighter the car you can have, the better while still retaining, you know, good safety and all that good stuff. So if you do the math and divide the 2,813 pounds by the 189 horsepower, that means that every horsepower of this car has to drag around 14.8 pounds. So there's a 14.8 pound per horsepower ratio. We'll talk about how this feels to drive because sometimes those numbers can still be deceiving even if you know the curb weight and do that math. But if you're looking at this Mini Cooper compared to other hot hatches on the market, like the Volkswagen GTI, like the Hyundai Veloster N, or even things like the current ND2 Mazda Miata, or the new Toyota GR86 and Subaru BRZ, this ratio is going to not look very competitive against those. If you want to be really competitive, you'll be shopping the John Cooper Works model. On paper, power to weight, maybe this is going to come across as a little bit slow, but that's not always the case in reality because how power is delivered also matters a whole lot. So we'll talk about that in the driving portion. As far as other important mechanical bits, all of the three gas-powered minis that are on sale as two doors, the base, the S, and the John Cooper Works, come with a standard six-speed manual transmission. Yes, they are still doing it. You need to keep buying them new. Otherwise, you cannot complain about this whole hashtag save the manuals thing. If you don't want a three-pedal manual transmission on your Mini Cooper, the base and this S, can be had with a two pedal option, of course. In both of those cases, it is a seven speed dual clutch transmission. So it is an automated manual. 
if you get the John Cooper Works. I suspect that DCT can't necessarily handle the power and torque of the John Cooper Works, uh, so you get an eight-speed torque converter automatic, but that's neither here nor there because this is the Mini Cooper S. It is a six-speed manual, and that's what we're here to talk about. Now, you'll notice this one is a fabulous shade of green. Mini continues to offer some really excellent paint colors across their entire model lineup, and this is called British Racing Green 4, and it is not British Racing Green. It's, it's a green. It's a very good green. I don't know if I'd call it BRG, but regardless, it's BRG to a point, according to Mini. It is paired to the gray roof, gray mirror caps. You can also have black, you can have body color, you can have white, in some cases you can have red. Now pricing wise, options wise, this is kind of the mid tier for packages that you can get on the Mini Cooper S. Mini built this one with the mid tier signature trim. You can move up to that full on iconic trim, but it doubles the price of the package from $4,000 to $8,000. As far as what you get with that $4,000 signature package, I have to use my phone because I'm really bad at remembering lists. Uh, you start off by getting comfort access, which means you can keep the key in your pocket the whole time or in your purse. You get these silvery gray roof and mirrors. You get the panoramic sunroof. You get heated seats. You get dual zone climate control. And you get a bigger, more expanded collection of paint colors. One of the biggest things that is worth doing is upping to either the signature or the iconic package for the paint color selection. You need to look at all of your different options to see based on what color you want, maybe how you have to equip it. Now the interesting thing here is that Mini also added the $1,000 navigation upgrade to this Cooper S with the signature trim, and that gives you wireless Apple CarPlay and built-in maps with the BMW Mini iDrive 6. MSRP here comes in at $34,850. We'll talk about the price while we're driving compared to some of the competition and again, the camp factor because I think they're charging for that and you either love it or you don't care about it. So with all that, that is the 2022 Mini Cooper S hardtop. Now let's get it out on the road and see how it is to drive. All right, so actually driving the Mini Cooper S, like I said, this is 189 horsepower, which on paper doesn't sound super exciting. And you know, it's still paired to a 2,800 pound car, which is amazing. But the power to weight ratio with this car is not really favorable compared to most of its competition. But there is an element of charm to this thing. And there has always been an element of charm to these cars. But you don't have to be going very fast in this car to make it feel so dang fun. And you can truly just pop off a little downshift, everyone will stare, and just, wee, off we go. It's, it is not too much power, it's not, not enough power either. I think this is the perfect amount of horsepower if you're okay with and understand the fun that comes with actually having to work a car a little bit to have some fun on public roads. There is a certain point where you end up with a lot of power, and yes, it's really fun to smash the throttle down an on-ramp and go very fast in a straight line, but how often can you do that and have a really good time versus, you know, 3,500 RPM, 5,000 RPM in second or third gear at 30 to 50 miles an hour and still enjoy that? Now, I've managed to catch the local school bus route. School is back in session, of course, so we're stopped here. I'm going to go ahead and get started again once the bus clears me of its red lights. Clutch take up here is fairly high, but it's easy. It's not tremendously difficult uh, to drive in a city environment. It's, it's pretty light, and the shifter is really quite good. Uh, it's just notchy enough that you know what gear you're in. You're not, you know, nothing's too vague, but it's also not so stiff that you have a hard time engaging gears. Now, I am doing all of the heel towing and rev matching by myself here. If you put the car in sport mode, it will rev match for you automatically on the downshifts. Uh, whether you like that or not is up to you. It's just a toggle here. Um, so it gives you a little bit more eager throttle and a little bit stiffer steering. And of course, that was all the car, that downshift. 
So if you're not quite sure how to rev match or you like the assistance, putting it in sport will do that. You can toggle it back down to the mid setting, the balance setting according to the car, and it will uh, force you to do it on your own. It also has this green setting, which I don't know why you need a setting for green when the whole car is painted green, but regardless, it has it. So I'll put it back in mid because I actually enjoy the steering feel and having to rev match for myself here. But this is a very easy, nice car to drive. My only complaint, you can kind of hear it there. I'll slow down a little and, and wind this out again. My only complaint with this car, with the transmission, is something that is a complaint I have among a lot of other stick shift brand new cars, and that is the rev hang. So you'll notice, I'll wind it out a little bit. I'm at Okay, almost 5,000 RPM. I'm gonna put the clutch in like I were shifting and you'll hear the engine stay around 5,000 RPM for just a hair longer than it should. So clutch in. It takes a really long time for it to come down in the revs. I'll do it again. It makes it kind of hard to shift smoothly, to upshift smoothly. The downshifts are easy. The pedals are positioned perfectly for heel toe. So you can really, crack off that sort of rev matching if you don't want sport mode, you can crack off the downshifts really easily. The upshift thing, the rev hang thing, it seems like every new car has it to a point, and I think it's all related to emissions and controlling any little last bits of unburnt fuel when you put the clutch in. So, is that annoying? Yeah, 100%, it's very annoying but it's a brand new car in 2022 with a six-speed manual and you, it's kind of what you're gonna get. I think the brakes are entirely adequate. I think the suspension is also entirely adequate. It's a little stiff in city driving and this is, you know, part of the appeal here is this is a city car, fun on back roads. In city driving though, uh, it's a little stiff. They do offer an adaptive suspension that has variable damping. This car doesn't have it. Um, I really like the simplicity of the way this car is optioned. And I think for the type of car that it is, you don't necessarily need the adaptive suspension. Just understand that you're going to be driving a car that is short wheelbase and kind of stiff. It's meant to be fun. It's not meant to be a soft, cruisy luxury car. One of my friends just picked one of these up in convertible form in zesty yellow, which is a fabulous color. And he described it as, you know, it's a, a fashion accessory. It's a fun fashion accessory, but still, it's uh, it's something that you're paying a little bit more for because of the quirk and the camp and the fashion. And this is not the Veloster N. The Veloster N, the whole point of that car is to be the most driver car for the money with the hatchback scene. The GTI is the more precise, the more German, the more, you know, buttoned up version of the hot hatch. This is the cheeky one. This is the one where every drive is playful. This, this is the puppy dog of hot hatches. As far as everything about this car that's not driving experience related, the interior is, of course, this is a German car. This is built by BMW. They know how to build cars for tall people. This car is great for tall people. I've got the seat as far back as I want it for my legs to be stretched out. They have a nice extendable thigh bolster here. And then I've got enough headroom. I've got the steering wheel that I can have cranked out so that I've got a safe uh, driving position where my hands want to be. Um, steering wheel wise, they've got this thing, pretty thick steering wheel. I don't know how much I love it. I think if it were a, a hair thinner, I would actually like it more. It would kind of add to that cheeky vibe. They're going for a sporty vibe here. And this is almost too thick of a steering wheel. I think people with smaller hands than mine might find it a little much. Uh, you do have some ambient lighting going on. This guy corresponds to your tachometer. You'll see if I put the clutch in and rev it, it lights up. It also changes if you adjust your climate control, your radio volume, it shows green, yellow, red on the backup sensors. So it's kind of clever. Um, it's a neat little touch. I do really miss the older minis that had the giant pie plate speedometer or the two analog gauges here in front of the driver. Um, they've got the, the iDrive screen here, which, you know, is fine. Um, it's, it's a touch screen and uh, it does work with Apple CarPlay, which is, of course, great to have. 
Um, no Android Auto, like I mentioned, this is on the older iDrive 6, and it just doesn't support Android Auto at all. Um, CarPlay is wireless, which is cool. The sound system in this one is not the Harman Kardon setup, and it is entirely fine. It's not bad. Uh, it, again, fits the vibe of being a little cheeky. It's not perfect, but it is totally fine. It's, it's good enough to blast with the sunroof open and the windows down and, you know, have your music up and have a lot of fun. So, you know, in that regard, it's fantastic. But they do offer a Harman Kardon setup. I think it's got limited availability right now, like everything else, because of the chip shortage. Uh, but, you know, is what it is. The base system is fine enough. I did mention this does have the dual zone climate, uh, which is fine if you care about that sort of thing. It's a small car. I'm just driving these same roads over and over because this is such a good car for it. It's just so small and it's just eager to... Ugh. Okay, back to the interior. Uh, front seats, tons of room, very comfortable. Back seats, like with all two-door minis, are, you know, fine if all four of you in the car are short. Um, if the front two passengers are tall, I hope your back seat passengers aren't actually friends of yours because they probably won't fit. Uh, you do get a decent amount of cargo space for the size of the overall car, both in the regular boot and if you put the back seats down, they do fold. So you've got some cargo space there. Um, the other really nice thing worth mentioning is the visibility in here. It is phenomenal. You've got a you know, really nice low dashboard. And when you turn around to look behind you, you've also not got a lot of pillar in the way. You know, this is an older design at this point. I mentioned this came out in 2014, but regardless, we need more cars with visibility like this. There is some driver assistance technology in this car, but not a ton. Uh, you do not get blind spot monitoring on this car. That is the one thing that I, th I really think everything should have because it's so helpful. Now granted, the visibility, like I said, is really good. A big part of being a safe car is simply having enough visibility and good enough handling that you can avoid an incident in the first place, not so that you can have technology that just, you know, uh, reacts to everything for you. So I wish it had blind spot monitors. Other than that, I think the tech in here is fine. All right, and that is it for this review of the 2022 Mini Cooper S hardtop with six speed. Thank you so much for coming along. As always, if you like what we're up to, please be sure to like, comment, subscribe, share everything right here on YouTube. If you'd like to follow us on other social media, we can be found on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Out Motorsports. And if you'd like to connect with other LGBT automotive enthusiasts, please head over to outmotorsports.com. We have a whole community over there, and we would love to have you join us. Until next time, please stay safe, be well. See you for the next one.